Hey, what's up guys? I'm Dr. Kasim Bhatt and I'm an interventional nephrologist with South Texas Renal Care Group right here in San Antonio, Texas. I'm also a physician that's pretty active on social media, trying to educate patients about their kidney health and creating video content that they can understand. Um, I am honored to be here at Cardio Renal Connections Conference hosted by UT Health San Antonio. I have attended the conference before, but this is my first time speaking, so I'm pretty psyched. Um, I would like to welcome y'all to the world of value-based medicine, okay? Value-based medicine means that you will no longer be compensated in the fee-for-service model, meaning the more times you see the patient, the more visits you do, the more procedures you, to, you do, the more you get paid. Rather, you're going to be judged on your health outcomes, meaning if you save the health insurance carrier money, you yourself will, uh, will make money off that savings. So uh, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, put these models out, these kidney care models out back in 2019. And I actually did a presentation then, but now I've kind of updated it. And I, what you, you need to understand is about a quick 20 minute presentation. And it's not there to bog you down with ex excessive details. Rather, I want you guys to take away, away big concept ideas, such as the metrics by which they'll, uh, they'll be judging physicians in the future. Um, also, just so you all understand, this is not just a Medicare thing. Um, I've talked to different commercial carriers, commercial, commercial insurances, and they too are implementing value-based medicine for kidney care as a whole because kidney disease is expensive and complex. Okay, And I don't think this is just in the kidney care realm. I think it's going to be applicable to medicine as a whole, and value-based medicine represents the future of medicine in the United States. So let's get started. Okay. So the American uh, Advancing American Kidney Health uh, Executive Order was signed into law July 10th, 2019. Um, and it was brought to us by Secretary of Health and Human Services, um, of Ale sorry, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Alex Azar, who has a very interesting story. His dad was actually uh, ESRD. His dad was actually on dialysis. He started in center, then went to PD, then actually got a kidney transplant. So Alex Azar has seen the entire spectrum of kidney care in this country. Um, so he wanted to improve it. So they came up with a bold new plan, a system that pays for kidney health rather than kidney sickness. And how do you do that? You got to come up with some goals, right? So they came up with three goals. Those three goals of the, uh, the goals of the executive order are by number, number one, by 2025, have 80% of new ESRD diagnoses start dialysis at home or get a preemptive transplant. Okay. Again, this is for patients in 2025 and beyond, not the current in-center patients um, um, that are in-center, but every new one from here on out, from 2025 out, they want 80% of them to start dialysis at home or get a preemptive transplant. By 2030, they want to reduce the incidence of ESRD by 25%. And by 2030, they want to double the number of kidneys available for transplant. Okay, so how do you get there? How do you get physicians there? How do you get nephrologists there? How do you get dialysis providers there? How do you get insurance carriers there? Well. Mm -hmm. You create new value-based kidney disease payment models, okay? And they came out with three, the e ESRD treatment choices model, the ETC, the kidney care first model, the KCF, and the comprehensive kidney care contracted model, the CKCC. For, for simplicity, simplicity purposes, I'm just gonna refer to them by their acronyms, okay? But let's just go over it. Now to understand these models, you really have to put the ETC model in one category and the KCF and the CKCC in another category. And the reason why is the ETC, guess what, is mandatory. CMS has selected the nephrologists and dialysis facilities that are going to partake in it, whereas the KCF and the CKCC are voluntary, meaning you had to apply for them and volunteer to partake in them. The other big difference is the ETC only involves ESRD patients. That's something we're kind of used to, the dialysis patients, right? But the KCF and the CKCC include ESRD, but also CKD4 and CKD5, the non-dialysis patients. So this is something new. They want us to manage those better. So let's start off with the mandatory model, the ETC. The ETC uh, creates financial incentives for ESRD facilities and managing nephrologists to pursue both home dialysis and kidney transplant. That's what they want. Those are lower cost than in-center hemodialysis. Okay, so they, the program will run from Jan, January one to twenty uh, January one, twenty twenty one, through June thirtieth, twenty twenty seven, and this is mandatory. CMS has randomly selected the participants. They've already randomly se selected thirty percent of, of facilities and managing nephrologists. Okay, they've already selected them, and it was based off of something called a hospital referral region, which is essentially a geographic area. And HRR, hospital referral region, essentially just a regional healthcare market that includes uh, uh, 
places that perform major cardiovascular procedures and neurosurgeries and neurosurgeries okay and this these these markers of uh, these uh, regions actually can cross state lines it's a new, different way to measure geography based off your regional healthcare market um, as far as uh, the model itself, how will CMS encourage both home dialysis and transplant? Well, by adjusting two payment, by, by including two payment adjustments. Okay, so they're going to change the way they pay you based off, based off of them. And um, the way they're going to do it is with a home dialysis payment adjustment and a performance payment adjustment. Okay, now the home dialysis payment adjustment is quite simple. It's essentially just an upward adjustment over three years. That's it. So in year one. Um, for da for dialysis and dial uh, home dialysis and home dialysis related services, they're going to increase uh, the payment for three percent by three percent in 2021, by two percent in 2022, and one percent in 2023. So again, upward payment over three years, no big deal, straightforward. The performance payment adjustment is different. This can increase your payment, but it can also decrease your payment over six years, okay? It's based off of two rates, the home dialysis rate and the transplant rate. Those two rates are they gonna include, okay? And you're awarded points um, based off your percentile rank and how you compare to your geographic benchmark area, benchmark year, compare. I'm gonna show you that in a second. And these points are weighted two thirds for home dialysis patients and one third for transplant, okay? So that's how they're weighted. And the number of points you acquire may increase or decrease your payment by a certain percentage. So nephrologists over the six years can have a bonus of four to eight percent over year to year um, and can have a penalty of five to nine percent, okay? Whereas dialysis units can have a bonus of five, uh, four to eight percent but also have a penalty of five to 10%, okay? Now for that transplant ratio we were talking about, just so you know, cause not everybody qualifies for transplant. In that transplant ratio, this excludes patients over 75 years old, patients on hospice and patients in a skilled nursing facility. So those are excluded from your transplant ratio that may ding you. As far as benchmarking for the, the performance payment adjustment, okay, the way it's done is you have a measurement year, right? Your measurement year. Um, say it's 2021, okay? Your benchmark year is actually 18 months before that in 2019 and 2020, okay? Now, based off of how your benchmark year compares to your measurement year, your payments will be adjusted in the following year in 2022, okay? So that's how it works. Benchmark year, measurement year, then your adjustment payments adjusted after. Now, the thing is about the be uh, benchmark year, y'all, I want you to understand, it's not always in 2019 and 2020. You're not always compared to 2019 and 2020. That benchmark year goes along with you because they assume that during the years, over the years, your your dialysis, uh, dialysis um, at home rate and your transplant rate will both go up. Okay, so they're gonna shift. Uh, your, so your markers are constantly shifting. Your your basis is constantly shifting with you as you improve. So the, in the ETC model, those are excluded from uh, excluded patients include beneficiaries outside the U.S. Patients lacking Medicare Part B. You have to have both A and B for these models. Medi people with Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, that although that may have changed, um, um, so we may have to look into that one. Patients with uh, who are less than 18 years old. Patients with dementia patients with hospice, patients uh, with acute kidney injury, and those in nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities, okay? So those are the excluded patients. As far as excluded clinicians, if you have a, if you have a small nephrology practice and you fall, below a low, uh, fall into a low volume threshold, you're not included. So the bottom 5% of all managing clinicians are not in included. As far as dialysis facilities, in order for a dialysis facility to qualify in a measurement year, you're going to have to have a total of 132 attributed beneficiary months. So you, all your patients in there have to have a total of 132 months that you've billed to Medicare um, to qualify uh, to qualify for this model. Now the voluntary models are the ones that get really interesting, um, the KCF and the CKCC. Now they are similar, and they are similar in, in the sense that they both involve the nephrology practice. Okay, they both involve the nephrology practice. But the CKCC is different because it also involves a transplant provider. Okay, and it can also possibly involve a dialysis unit and other providers. So you have other people sharing the risk with you here. Okay, so together the, these form something called a kidney care entity, a KCE. So this KCE spreads the risk, whereas in uh, the KCF, um, you're by yourself, okay, as a nephrology practice, okay? So that's how you can go into these voluntary models. These voluntary models include patients with CKD4, 5, and ESRD. They want us managing CKD4s and 5s better, 
okay? It runs from Jan 1, 2020 through December 31st, 2025. Year zero, 2020 is a, is, is a mulligan year, essentially. You build care relationships and create infrastructure. Year one starts April, April 1st, 2021. It's supposed to start Jan 1, but now it starts because of COVID pushed it April 1st. Um, and that's when financial accountability starts this year, okay? And this is the payment, uh, the, the KCC model timeline. Um, in order to be involved in these voluntary models, just so you know, you've had to apply um, in early 2020. CMS then selected you. You signed a participation agreement. Then CMS actually aligned those beneficiaries to you, the patients. They aligned to you. You didn't pick those patients. As far as the responsibilities of the participant, you had to create a driver diagram, which is essentially like a uh, game plan for how you're going to approach how you're going to approach it. Answer uh, surveys and interviews. Participate participate in webinars. Track and report on quality improvement efforts and a possible in annual in-person uh, meetings in D.C., although post-COVID, I don't know if they're going to have this. And you're also subject to audits of medical charts as well, too. But given all this stuff here, guys, all that stuff, um, you know, you're going to probably have to hire a, a full-time employee, FTE, to handle all this because this is a lot of time and a lot of effort to go into this. Um, those excluded from the voluntary kidney care models include beneficiaries outside of the U.S., those that lack both Medicare Part A and B, um, <clears throat> uh, Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare as a secondary payer, um, less than 18 years old, uh, those with acute kidney injury, again, you have to have ESRD as a diagnosis. And if you receive most of your care um, outside of the practice market area, you have to receive at least 50% of your care in your practice area. So those snowbirds that go from Minnesota to Texas for three months, those don't really count, okay? As far as the KCF, again, it's for nephrology practices, and those practices typically have to have at least 400 CKD4s and 5s and 200 ESRD patients. You'll receive a capitated payment on a per-patient basis, no more fee-for-service, capitated payments, okay? And then you'll receive a bonus payment if your kidney receives, a, if your patient receives a kidney transplant, and that full amount of that transplant bonus will actually be allocated over three years, provided the, the transplant remains successful, okay? So these are the three payments I want you all to pay attention to. This is how they're gonna run these models. It's three different capitated payments. And just so you all know, in the, uh, in the nephrology world, if you're not from the nephrology world, the nephrologists run a bill and MCP, a monthly capitated payment already for a dialysis patient. We get paid a certain amount for one visit, a certain amount for two visits. The third visit doesn't change the payment, but the fourth visit gives us the full amount, okay? So we get an MCP based off of that. So we have an adjusted MCP here. Now that, uh, Pay, that's paid monthly, that doesn't change, but what they've done is taken the home dialysis payment, which was lower, and made it equal to the four visit in-center MCP. So they made, made it equal. Now initially, what was fascinating was in 2019, that four visit MCP, one, two, three, four, they got rid of that. They just paid you one m m amount equivalent to the two visit MCP. But apparently, a lot of physicians and RPA, Renal Physician Association, um, uh, got, uh, uh, contested it and that's all gone now, okay? Um, the second payment that's important is the CKD QCP, the quarterly capitated payment. That's for your CKD fours and fives. It's paid quarterly, guys, quarterly. So you get a constant revenue stream quarterly um, and it doesn't vary by the number of times you see the patient in your office. And it doesn't include your inpatient visits or your procedures. Those are still billed fee-for-service. I'm an interventional nephrologist. I'm always concerned about the procedures. I still will still bill those fee-for-service based off your ASC and OBL modules, not off of a capitated payment here. But that capitated payment, just so you know, you guys billers out there, that will include these payments here. These, uh, sorry, these codes here. So these codes are included in that cap day payment and do not get you any extra payments, okay? Then thirdly, the last one is the mo one of the most significant ones is a transplant bonus, and this is $15,000 paid over three years, okay? They want you to keep that kidney going over those years, okay? So that's, that's only, it's, only, it's only paid if it's continued to be successful. So after year one of the transplant, $2,500. Year two, $5,000. Year three, $7,500. Again, this is a significant revenue stream from a patient, but it's a good revenue revenue stream because it's keeping that patient off dialysis. <clears throat> then you have the performance-based uh, adjustment in the KCF. That's where you're, you're, you actually have to have six-month performance periods. And there's a relative performance component um, where you're compared to other KCF practices 
and a continuous performance component where you're compared to yourself earlier in the model. So you're constantly being compared to either your other practices or yourself earlier, and that's how they kind of judge you, okay? Um, payments will be adjusted based off quality and utilization measures. The practice will be placed in one through eight scoring levels, and the top 50% will have an upward adjustment. The top 50% of practices will have an upward adjustment. The bottom 50% of practices will have a zero to negative adjustment. So you can have a 30% upside, but also a 20% 20, uh, 20 downside. So you better know what you're doing as a nephrology practice if you go into this model, okay? As far as your, uh, as far as uh, the the CKCC, this one you have to form a uh, kidney contracting entity. Again, this is a collection of your nephrology practice, a transplant provider, plus a dial plus or minus a dialysis unit and other providers. Okay, now that transplant provider, what is that? That's one transplant nephrologist, one transplant surgeon, one transplant center, plus or minus an organ pro procurement organization. Okay, that transplant provider can be a part of multiple KCEs, but a nephrology practice can also be only be a part of one KCE. Okay, just remember that. As far as your practice, you'll have to have at least 75, uh, 750 CKD fours and fives and 350 ESRD patients. Now, similarly, those capitate payments I went over, those three are similar uh, with the KCF, with the transplant bonus. But in this pay case, the transplant bonus is allocated a little, little different, li differently because you have the KCE. 20% go to the nephrologist, 20% to the transplant provider, and 60% is at the discretion of the entity itself. Okay, so the entity gets to decide the, the, the majority of it. Um, as far as what the KCE is, the entity itself, it must be a separate legal entity with its own tax ID number. It must have it must have its own governing board, like a board of directors. And on that board, you got to have nephrologists, other providers, participants, patients with um, ESRD or CKD, uh, or a patient advocate. Okay. And the members of this board have a fiduciary relationship to the KCE, not the practice. So if you're a nephrologist in that practice, your loyalty is to this board. Okay. Um, you will take responsibility of the total cost and quality of care of the patient. That's different. They want us to take care of everything. In exchange, you receive a portion of Medicare savings. So that's how they want to get you. You save, we, you, you save, we, we, you make money. And the way they do that is they kind of judge you and your practice by your risk profile, right? So if you're more, depending on how risk averse you are, you can decide which one you want. So you have the three models, the graduated, where you can kind of go and gradually increase your risk and reward. You have the professional where you can actually um, just share in 50% of the savings, uh, uh, savings and losses of total Medicare A and B. And the global, which you share in 100% of the savings. So if you share, save Medicare money, you get to save, save all of that. You get to sh uh, keep all of that. But again, that's only for A and B. Now, in addition with the global, it's different because they want you to manage the whole patient. So they ha give you additional TCC, a total care capitation, which is a monthly capitated risk adjusted payment. Okay, because they're managing everything. You're the quarterback here. They're changing it. They don't want the PCB being quarterback. They want you being the nephrologist being quarterback. As far as these models, what, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get more preemptive transplants, meaning before they ever need dialysis, get them a transplant before they ever need dialysis, okay? Um, so as their kidney disease progresses. They wanna create finan strong financial incentives to move patients through the transplant process, improve the transition to dialysis and avoid hospitalization. Guys, they don't want us to do this thing where we wait for the patient to get shorter breath, send them to the ER, they put a Quinton catheter in, start dialysis, get a permacath, seven to 10 la days later of a hospitalization, they get an outpatient dialysis unit. They want us to get an access working in the arm or start them on PD and get that access working and get that done all as an outpatient. Initiate dialysis as an outpatient. That's how they're gonna save money, okay? They want us to manage the total cost and quality of care of patients with kidney disease and kidney failure. And this is the key one at the end, okay? Additionally, CMS wants to demonstrate whether kidney disease is being delayed by these models interventions. That's why they're throwing in CKD fours and fives. They wanna see if you're putting the nephrologist as the quarterback, does that slow down the progression of CKD four and five and keep them off dialysis? Because dialysis costs them a lot. Okay, cost Medicare a lot. So again, I'd like to reiterate that the models I just presented are for kidney disease by Medicare, but their application is really in a broader sense, right? Eventually CMS will apply these to other disease processes and management of patients as a whole, and it will have a broader, a broader application to commercial insurance carriers as well. Value-based medicine represents the future of medicine in the United States. Thank you again for listening to my presentation and I look forward to your questions.